if we're going to change the world, each one of us has to change ourselves. When we keep saying that I've got it, you have to change, then we never change. And that keeps the world in the same place. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. The Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring innovators, disruptors, and creators who are breaking through the status quo to change the way business happens today. These are exciting times. My name is Michael Johnson. I'm here with my co-host, Tyler Kelly, and we are here today with Darian Wigfall. We're super excited to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, man. I'm excited to be here. Welcome, yeah. welcome. So uh, Darian is an author, an activist, an arts organizer, a DJ, and an entrepreneur. He co-directs the St. Louis-based Farfetch Music Collective an art imprint that produces progressive music and art in St. Louis and beyond. He's written a book called A Dying Breed. It's volume one, which means there's got to be a volume two, three, and four. Coming. Coming. And, uh, you know, he's also, like, famous for some direct action that happened in Ferguson, you know, during those years that we all, you know, know so well. Uh, His sign is in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, so that's pretty cool too. Uh, Darian, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. So, Darian, this is kind of a fun podcast for us because myself, I have a music background, and Tyler used to be DJ as well, so there's a whole musical connection there. So, awesome. so tell me early on how you got into music to start with. Ooh, man, uh, that goes back to when I was a very young child. I think I credit most of my musical history to my father because he had, like, he was in choir and he sang a lot uh, throughout his childhood and stuff like that. But uh, his family was very musical. His sister actually dated one of the drummers for James Brown at one point. Um, And so we had this crazy record collection, eight tracks and tapes and all that kind of stuff. And he never really had to coax me into listening to it. I just kind of, like, went and dug through and played stuff. And he had things like the Beatles and Mahalia Jackson, James Brown, a lot of Motown, um, Waylon Jennings. He loved country. He was from North Carolina. He is from North Carolina. Um, And so it it really started there. But then, I don't know, we got I got a little bit older and around nine or ten in Parkway, you had to play an instrument in Suzuki string. So I picked the violin and I played that from third through fifth grade. And I liked it, but I wanted to try brass, so I played trumpet uh, from sixth grade till till about high school when I started getting into girls. You know, uh, the band nerds don't get the girls, so that's when I started playing uh, guitar. Was when I was that age. <laughs> yeah, see, <laughs> you switch over to the cool instrument. Yeah, I kind of like started playing drums a little bit um, for high school, but I didn't do much musically. I was still singing in the choir at church um, and just like playing around with my friends singing, but. Uh, then I bought my first set of turntables my senior year, actually the summer after my senior year in high school. And it was on from then, like at that point I just started buying records and DJing house parties and stuff like that. And from DJing, I got into producing and from producing, got into starting my own business for production and like making albums for artists. And that really is what led me up to far fetched at this point. So Far Fetch is an independent music label. Is that the best way to describe that? Yeah. So independent music is blowing up. Like, really, it is the standard. Yeah, I think it always has been. And the industry always robbed from independent artists and, like, used those elements to make pop hits. But, like, yeah, now it's it's at a point where, yeah, the well, you you all know the the platform is leveled with the Internet. Like, the, the industry can't react fast enough to catch up with what's coming out just independently so you see a lot more of it blow up so how'd you get involved with farfetch it's an interesting story at least to me um i was running my own company called versatility media group i had one artist that i was trying to promote at the time and me and david davis had met each other probably around the time he was starting farfetch and i was starting uh what we called vmg at the time and i went to him on sort of like we're kind of trading ideas let me bounce this idea off a couple people that i also know that have labels 
and I bounced it off one other guy and he was like that's a cool idea uh, good luck and what the idea was I was seeing the resurgence this is like 2013 I was seeing the resurgence of vinyl as a medium to listen to music it, but like CDs were dying and I was like but everything comes back so at some point CDs will come back too what could we do to be ahead of the curve to make that like cooler than your normal CD experience and so I thought of this uh this casing that was designed to be like a cube once you uh, buy it and it's like shrink wrapped and it's flat but then you take the shrink wrap off and then it pops into a cube and when I took it to Damon he was like oh as an artist he was like oh we can do this in like plastic or wood and like this material and that material and that color and uh, we were really excited about that but then at the end of that meeting he was like I've been thinking about an executive team for my company, Farfetched, and you're one of the first people I thought of because he had seen what I'd, I'd uh, done with promotion with my artist, Lauren D., who's now since moved on to North, uh, South Carolina. Um, but yeah, so we met on that, but then the thought was maybe a couple of weeks before that I was doing with my company what everybody else in St. Louis does is like, oh, I don't like this thing, so I'm going to start my own thing. Um, and it's going to be way better than everybody <laughs> else's, right? Um, but, and it was going fine. It wasn't bad. But I, I knew that if I wanted to be stronger, I needed to change that mentality in myself. If I was going to, like, bring people together um, that were doing music and make it stronger as a scene. And so maybe a couple of weeks before that meeting with Damon, I had that thought. And so as soon as he said that, I was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And so he asked me to come meet the team. And, uh, about January, 2014, I, we had a meeting over at Sonata McDermott from cave of swords house and it just felt like home. Wow. And yeah, from then on we've been running. So you're, in, you're involved in a lot of other things than music though. You're an yeah. author an activist and and i mean your bio is pretty long so <laughs> yeah. so tell me i tried uh, to make it shorter too <laughs> tell me some of those other things like how did you get involved in writing and, and things like that writing was a that was another thing that was like divinely inspired like I, I i was always a good writer like essays in school and all that kind of stuff and short stories was fun but i never thought of myself as a writer but then i was mentoring a young man named earl willis who's credited in that book uh at Fanning Middle School through a program called uh, Urban Future One-on-One -on -one Inspire Mentors. And it was all about character development and things like that. And we were reading and he was really good in school, but I could see that the kids around him weren't as focused on school. So they were doing drugs and they were drinking and they were having sex early and things like that. And I was like, who's telling his story? After I finished, because it was only seventh and eighth grade, um, after I finished with that term, I was like, who's telling his story? And like how many other kids are out there like him that don't see themselves reflected in what they're reading? Cause like none of the stuff that we read was anything like that. I mean, Bud Not Buddy was probably one of the closest stories to that, but like it's, it's still about this impoverished kid in like Flint, Michigan. So it's not as relatable, but, um, at the time I was working at WashU and something put it on my heart to just write, write his story. And so I could reach more kids that way. And the thought was, even if I mentored like every year for the rest of my life, I could maybe only reach 40, 50, 60 more kids. But with a book and telling his story and really even encouraging him to tell his own story and kids to tell their own story, um, I could reach like millions of people. That's awesome. And it's a self-published book. Yep. And you're working on uh, one for females as well? Right. Called Not So Princess Jasmine. Okay. Yeah. So same, same setup or? Similar setup. She's uh, just one of Deshaun's friends. Uh, you'll meet her in that first book. But she has since moved out of the city and into the county. And so she's struggling with going to a private school and being like one of the only black kids there and things like that. So um, that that actually more mirrors my experience having grown up in Creve Coeur, uh, West County of St. Louis. Um, so I, I, I just kind of wanted to show two different experiences, but also, you know, the overlap within that uh, for kids that are black in the city. And that's cool because, I mean, in the sense that you're tying the books together what is, okay. what's the age group like who is it like teenagers like 13 17 i'd say it's that's a hard question to answer because it's written at a fifth grade level like when okay. i did the uh little counter online or whatever it said it was written at a fifth grade level so i say 10 and up but then i had a friend's son read it who's eight years old 
and he said something so profound that I was like, he clearly gets it. So he read it and he goes to Brentwood or something like that. And he was, he was like, daddy, I think this is a good story, but I don't think my teachers will get it. And I was like, wow. Like a, a kid who's eight years old understands that, yeah, these, these teachers don't know about this experience, but I understand what this kid was going through somehow. And it's connected with some teenagers too. Uh, when I was working at the Central Public Library, uh, a bunch of kids just wanted to read it. They found out I had written a book. Um, and the, yeah, they were all up, uh, all over it, around, around 15 or 16. And some of them even read it within a shift while wow. I was there. You think cool. part of that's just like, at a certain point, adults just don't get kids? Or do you think there, it's something like just deeper more like a cultural difference well i think that adults get it too what uh what it's really been able to do is open up a conversation between adults and kids about some of the difficult conversations about drug use about things like that um because well there's a few counselors in parkway and i think barack obama middle school that are using it to uh to kind of open up a conversation with some of their students so um adults definitely get it but as a as a child obviously he didn't understand the adults from mind to be able to get it but he understood that yeah the cultural difference my okay. my white woman teachers aren't gonna get what this young black boy was going through in this story okay. and maybe for for some context like I, I know that this is not this isn't a situation that's like unique to st louis like this evolves this this right. is every city right but uh, maybe for a little bit more context and for someone listening like what is that play that out a little bit yeah actually the first book uh is written more universally so i didn't use st louis as a character in the book but um a good a writer friend of mine told me that that was that was a better thing to do especially because so i writ, wrote this before ferguson happened uh-huh. before mike brown was killed and i think that even changed how i frame how i write the book now so um i even say this is sort of the story of mike brown before he became a hashtag so like mike brown wanted to study music and he was actually going to be taught by my first artist lauren d who uh, used to teach at Extreme Institute by Nelly. She was a uh, she has a degree in music engineering, so she te- teaches production, recording, and some other things over there. So she would actually had him as a student had he lived, and so now I use St. Louis as a character and not so Princess Jasmine, and it will be used in a Dying Breed volume two as well, just because of if if I'm here living in St. Louis and I'm from St. Louis and all that happened in St. Louis, it would be almost, yeah, it would be a mistake for me not to use that as a character. But uh, yeah, the first one doesn't even mention a city because I I think that this is something that is, yeah, it's definitely nationwide, if not global at this point. So like you mentioned Mike Brown and all the things that happened a few years ago in mm-hmm. that respect, the bio says you're an activist mm-hmm. before or after. Before, for sure. Uh, around 2012, when I was writing this book, I joined the U- Universal African People's Organization. Um, but before that, I had like I had joined the NAACP, which I just I won't get started on that. But like, <laughs> it wasn't the right place for me, so I wanted to go more grassroots, and that's why I joined the UAPO. But it was really hard to recruit even black people into a movement for liberation before Mike Brown was killed, and after it was just like everybody wanted to join. It was interesting. Uh, flip because yeah it was almost like pulling teeth with even black people before Mike Brown was killed but yeah uh, the zeitgeist changed and so here we are and you grew up in Creve Corps mm-hmm. I grew up in North County and it's crazy because like for people that are listening to that are from St. Louis or from North County specifically mm-hmm. it's like that's how it was forever. It was always like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like the fact that you're, you know, this, that what you say is like people just weren't interested in mm-hmm. yeah, doing we did anything a lot of about it. In you North know? County too. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Until it, it's like, it just piles and piles and it eventually like, yeah. Boom. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're just trying to survive. You're like, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to rock the boat. Cause it, might change my situation but then yeah at a certain point it's like well we have been taking this all this time why not just like release what we've been holding all this time you know and i preface that with like i'm from north county and it happens all the time but what i wanted what i really should say is that 
it happened for us all the time. And what we discovered in that whole situation is that it happens all over the country all the time. Right, right. And the thing about that is I was in the Bronx visiting a friend of mine. Uh, so I went to Hampton University my freshman year in college, and I met him there. And he was from the Bronx. and was back there teaching in high school. And so he wanted me to come talk about the book. And I was talking to some of his friends, and they were – obviously started talking about Ferguson when they found out I was from St. Louis and that I was an activist and things like that. And they were like, we were inspired by y'all because you didn't go away. Like if you, most protests happen, even with Trayvon Martin, uh, most, pro- most protests happen maybe for a week, maybe a couple of weeks and then it kind of goes away. But when we saw y'all out there like 40 days, 50 days, 60 days, and then over a hundred days, it was like, well, we're experiencing that too. So if they're going to stay out, why don't we go out? And so I, I'm, I can't speak for the whole country, but I'm pretty sure that's sort of the mentality of all the cities kind of, yeah. One after the other starting to, yeah. Cause yeah, even Eric Garner was killed in New York in July of that year, uh, or maybe the year before. Uh, so and nothing really happened from that so it was just yeah there was something special about what happened here in st louis for sure i always think st louis has a very misplaced sense of self sometimes or okay. high, high self-esteem um because at one time we were the shit but like we're not anymore so we still feel like we are but we need what's to that do some one more. time uh, like at the turn of this last century, so like before Chicago, yeah, all, exactly, like, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, like the World's Fair. That I didn't know if you were gonna say like when Nelly came out with. Oh uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that, but it's a joke. But it, musically, like yeah. people leave, like talented artists, like do they leave St. Louis? Like, yeah, that's what we're trying to change. That's what we're trying to change. I really want to create a platform that people can do it here and that at least the majors have some kind of representative, whether that's an office here, maybe even in Cortex or something like that, that we can go to and get them signed. Or, you know, they just have an eye on St. Louis so much so that when they're ready to sign somebody. They don't have to leave here and go to LA. They just sign them while they're here. And we kind of help them negotiate that or structure that or whatever it is. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, there's good stuff. There's good stuff happening in St. Louis musically. Oh right? yeah. So much. I mean, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think of all the people that are art- artists that, you know, a yeah. lot of them are from St. Louis, even though they don't live right, in Right, in the Louis. mainstream. Yeah, right. exactly. One of the biggest hip-hop producers right now, Metro Boomin, went to my high school, Parkway North. Wow. So, like, I didn't go to high school with him, but I actually babysat a kid that did. Um, but, yeah, like that, and, like, Scissors pop in. She, she was here. And, like, uh, the the rumors that Future was here for a while. He's not from here, but he was here for a while doing some music. Um, Smino of Chicago, like... Yeah, it's there's a ton of us out there, and then you even look at acting like uh, that's an art too. Like, uh, I was just thinking on how the Office uh, cast has like three people yeah. from St. Louis, whether that's Phyllis, uh, what's her girl's name? That's they're coming Jim. back with the Office, yeah. Too, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's crazy. So all these all these things that you're doing, you're, you're in music, you're in activism, you're an author. Mm-hmm. Are you finding like there's a common thread that's driving you? That you what what is it you're trying to accomplish with all of these kind of seemingly separate endeavors? I'm gonna sound cliche and maybe like a jerk, but uh, to to change the world, man. To put it simply, to change the world, like the world is sick and it's not doing well so somebody has to change it i'm not saying i'm the only one that's working on that because clearly this is a collective and a team effort and everybody has to be in it but like everybody has to be committed to changing the world so if i don't commit to changing the world how can i tell somebody else not to you know so, yeah. yeah so um, i'm gonna dig a little deeper but like in what sure. way what is it that you what is it you want for people what is it that you want to change i want to see I hate, yeah, people say this word a lot too. It's becoming a buzzword, equality. Like, equal justice, equal, I put it like this. So, they say the the color of your skin shouldn't determine your outcomes, right? But I feel like we need to take it a step further and look at, no matter what your skin color, 
you're allowed to succeed or fail at the same rate and not have that be attributed to it being your skin color. So like every and it doesn't matter what color you are. There's people that are not going to do not going to uh, put in tremendous effort and then there are people that are going to put in a tremendous effort to achieve whatever their goal is and some people are fine with just yeah not doing much of anything um, but it doesn't it's not because of what they look like it's because of who they are so ultimately yeah like Martin Luther King said it's it's about uh, the the character of the man or the woman or the person I should say uh, it's not about yeah skin color does do you think like technology levels the playing field in a sense that people can't because a lot of like that inequality is based on you know i and i'm not saying Mm. i but like a person will look and see somebody different from them Mm -hmm. and make a judgment good or bad right yeah and so is there a world where technology maybe like prevents that step judgment from happening because it's all based on like stuff that's out there in the interwebs or? to a degree to a degree i think that it does it more does in connect business us. in life because yeah. obviously there's like all the whole life you R- know right like just, there's yeah there's two <laughs> levels to yeah. that because i think uh devices in general are, are disconnecting us but there's a connectivity in the fact that i can see how another culture lives halfway around the world without leaving my living room so um, I think, yeah, to a degree, it, it is leveling, leveling the playing field. But ultimately, what has to happen is humanity has to come together as a whole. And the device is not going to do that for us. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, this is a huge question that we haven't fixed. But like, yeah, to you, what are our biggest hurdles standing in the way of mm. um, equality, understanding each other better? All I mean... Obviously, that's a huge problem. And yeah. bef- before you answer that, because I like that question, I'm going to just like tag on or you know add to it. Mm-hmm. Is there's this idea of diversity in the workplace, mm-hmm. which is just like bringing you know it, it's 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 a corp- corporate way of making things appear to be equal. Yeah, yeah, you know appear what I'm saying. To be equal perception. But then there's like inclusion, which is like you said everybody has has an equal chance exactly so like with michael's question like how do we get there the real there not the like the superficial there yeah not the like politician answer of there uh all right if you want to (laughs) go if you want to get deep we can get deep we can get i think uh just with my science background i think the number one thing that's getting in our way is human human behavior normal human behavior like the way we are wired to receive stimuli especially when it comes to a threat um is as hardwired as anything in our instinctual like library of of behavior so like that's the number one thing that number one hurdle but the fact that we can divorce ourselves from previous beliefs is like the the counter to that right so like i'm hardwired to see somebody that doesn't look like me and be afraid but when I actually talk to that person, I understand that they just they're much more like me than I initially thought. But my brain was hardwired because their skin color was different or they're taller or they're a man or they're a woman that they're different. Could be a threat. Fight or flight. You ready? Uh, go. And so, like, that's why a lot of t- a lot of times, uh, especially if you're encountering people that have never met a white person before or never met a black person before they might be thrown off and just kind of not be able to have a conversation with you. Cause they're just like, should I be running right now? Or am I safe or what? So, um, yeah, the, the way our brains are wired is not meant for that kind of harmony. Once the idea of the separateness is introduced. So like, I think ultimately we understand that we're all part of one thing. Right. But like, we don't act like that because of the conditions that we're in and the and the narratives that we're fed uh, growing up. So, obviously, kids aren't racist when they're, you know, born. So, that's taught over time. So, the other major hurdle that we're facing is, yeah, the, basically the propaganda that uh, reinforces white supremacy around the world. And 
until that's gone there's really no going back so i I read this book called thinking in systems by Donella meadows she's actually a sustainability professor at dartmouth um but she just writes beautifully about how systems work and how most people don't can't think in systems or don't think in systems um usually most people see one or two parts of that system say policing and education but there's a whole system of society that also includes health care and uh, elderly care and, you know, child care and, you know, all the other things that make up our society. So until we understand how those things are interconnected and the purposes or really the outcomes of those systems, then we can't change it. And what usually ends up happening is because we don't understand the entire system, we operate on it in the wrong direction. And the simple uh, illustration that she uses for that is a bathtub full of water that has a, fa- a faucet. So the flow of information, uh, let's, let's be specific and say uh, the, the narrative about white supremacy. That's, that faucet has been on blast since the 16, 1700. Um, so until somebody kind of turns it down a little bit, that level of knowledge is going to stay the same. But once you turn it down a little bit, it starts to fade. But if you turn it off, then it completely drains the bathtub. But there are other factors that make it not so simple. It's like a room heating and cooling. There's always air flowing in and out of the room, but then there's a thermostat that tries to keep it at the same temperature. So like there's there's other mitigating factors. So like it's not as simple as turning a faucet on. But once we understand where those faucets are and the interconnections that make them work and the people that can control the flow because what she says is anything that has been consistent over time has someone someone is controlling that uh the flow of that stock is what she calls it um and so until we change that that initial stock in the bathtub and then we also find out where the control mechanisms are then yeah nothing's going to change in that regard um so yeah those are the two major hurdles that's deep. Uh, but I'm, there's all, also like smaller ones, but yeah, I think those are the two major hurdles. That's deep. You, you know, it reminds me, and I'm not going to be able to quote this correctly, but on my Facebook page, I have a header, which is a Buck uh, Mr. Fuller quote. Mm. And do you remember, do you, have you been on my Facebook page mm. lately? I'll, I'll give you the gist of it. It's basically like there's no point in trying to, jump in and like change existing systems like Mm. you have to create your new you have to create new systems Mm. like that's how you fight yeah he doesn't use the word fight but that's how you change the world right is you create a new system and it reminds me of gary Mm. v you know gary v yeah he recently has been talking about the nba okay and how like the players are at a point in just like their um value for lack of a better word Mm -hmm. that they could literally go out and start their own league and there would be no NBA because there's, yeah. I mean, you know, I thought that about the NFL when Kaepernick was doing yeah. his thing. I was yeah. like, why don't y'all just take your money and start your own league? Just like Vincent McMahon did. Yeah. He did it on his own. Y'all got, y'all got many millionaires. It didn't make any sense to me, but that's, and that's with basketball, it's, you know, there's only like, you know, 10 players on a team mm-hmm. and the majority are African American. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a real, it's a real thing. Like yeah. it could happen. It could happen. Especially and it's like, tracks. And so when you're saying like the flow, like that's a perfect example of the flow. Like, yeah. you know, like those people have been in that money for so long. For so like, long. Yeah. They keep turning it yeah. up. No, no stopping. And just like, and she also talks about this with economic growth. So like we measure economies by economic growth, GDP, but like, does that actually work for the people? And it doesn't. So like we keep wanting to grow GDP, but actually the growth of GDP is what's call it, causing all the poverty and all the other problems that we're having and accelerating it is making it worse when you need to actually like maybe slow down or stop for a second. It's yeah, we just need to start a new system. Wow. That's right. So we're here in St. Louis. I mean, we're, we're like the microcosm of, of all of these issues. Like mm-hmm. the, the amazing thing about St. Louis, in my opinion, is that like it doesn't matter what angle you approach any social issue from, any racial issue from, like St. Louis is at the epicenter, yep. I think. Yep. You know what I mean? Like Part two. We're just like east, west, north, south. Like it's mm-hmm. all like right here. Yeah. So, no you know. it's so concentrated. <laughs> I never thought about it like that, but every, yeah, everything's so potent here. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, it, you know, people want to, like, leave St. Louis. And, like, you know, Michael and I go down to Atlanta a lot. We're like, Atlanta. Atlanta is, like, I heaven. Like Atlanta. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everyone loves Atlanta. From yeah. St. Everyone from St. Louis loves Atlanta. Mm. Because it's there's just a different energy there. Yeah. But uh, to my question of just, like, St. Louis and that representation to the world, like, and what you're doing, you know, like, and what you're working on right now, like, with like your DJ and your art mm-hmm. and your representation of artists, you know, like the whole nine yards, mm-hmm. like what does the future look like when you actually make inroads, when society actually starts to be more equal? Like what's the future look like for us? Oh, what's the future look like for like humanity or for like For, for humanity Louis? when Darian has okay. been able to make a dent. Okay. It actually like affect. I the, think the about ripples. this a lot. Like I, I see it already. There are glimmers of it already, especially when I see. So I live in Tower Grove East, and when I see like black kids and white kids walking down the street together, and it looks fine, or like an older black dude and a younger like Latin person walking side by side, like coming from a class at the International Institute, it looks like that, but like when we look at them there's no stigma so like it's just that's yeah that's normal that's normal and maybe they're even partners like that just are of different colors and and that happens here too um but there's when we look at it there's no like oh they shouldn't be together like it's just like oh yeah that's that's jane and paul so let me put you on the spot because you mentioned fight or flight like the reptilian brain for those of you who want to google it. yeah there you go Um, that's science is that like is that possible i mean is that like is it just like another 500 years of evolution i mean what is it i think it is it will be an evolution uh i think those those traits in people are already being seen especially in the kids that are coming up now behind us um so that the people well i don't know though because uh, if you've ever seen that movie idiocracy uh it says that the smarter people stop procreating as much so they might have one kid whereas like the less intelligent, less uh, collaborative people um, are having more kids. So they're having like eight and like six and five every generation. So there's like more of them in the future. And what's interesting about that is a reality TV star slash wrestler was elected to be president (laughs) um, in that movie. And they're trying to water crops with Gatorade because it has electrolytes. <laughs> you know what? I didn't know the title, but um, I've seen the movie. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 I know yeah, what you're yeah. talking about. So I, I don't know. I think that element will always be around. You will never be able to eliminate racism or any type of colorism or any type of oppression overall. But I think that, and uh, your listeners may not want to hear this, but I think that capitalism really holds those things in place. So capitalism holds all those systems of oppression in place because what I was saying to a friend the other day is like, you can gain power without money. I was thinking about Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King and people like that, but you can't maintain power without money. So like the people who have money can maintain their power. And the, and the problem with that is they will continue to keep that pump on with all those sources of oppression that keep us divided and until we just have like a solar flare and there's no electricity and nobody can watch TV and all we have is to talk to each other, uh, that may maybe not that's change. a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, I interpret it as learning. You know, basically learned behaviors. Mm-hmm. You know, so we do have that like instinctual. Yeah. fight or flight mm-hmm. but then we also have all these like sus- this social or societal conditioning that mm-hmm. gets tagged onto us and we all love like at least i do you know i love seeing pictures of like black brown white like the kids like mm-hmm. hugging each other like love it's it. always like it's an emotion like when you see it it's emotional even if it's stock footage right right uh and i have three kids michael has two do you have any kids there no no, no kids. you're not married yet not yet not yet he's not single yet. ladies <laughs> <laughs> i am uh and I see that in person, you know. I mean, yeah. my kids go to a, a city charter school. It's very diverse, you know. Um, I told you I grew up in North County, so I grew up in a diverse neighborhood. Uh, and those relationships are real. But then, mm. like, that society – so, like, as parents, like, you know, right. there's only so much we could do because the problem is they go to school 
And right. that's where that conditioning starts. Yeah, somebody's right. going to teach that's them. What, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, that has also been conditioned. Exactly. The thing. And, it, and so like what you're saying, like when it's like, it's time to change the world, mm-hmm. like we can't change the world just at home. Right. We, I mean, we, because of the society, the social conditioning, like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this world has to be changed. Like obviously like God, you said from the inside out. Yep. But at some point it has to get out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, it has to be an inside. So I think that, the change changing the world is the most what did uh so chadwick boseman was on that show Jesus and mirror the other day and he said giving is the most selfish thing you can do and i didn't get it at the moment but i was like yeah because well if i'm thinking about it in the context of changing the world um if we're going to change the world each one of us has to change ourselves so what i believe what i've been conditioned to believe has the change and if you do that then and and uh michael does that and travis does that and and the other tyler does that and everybody does that then the world changes but unless when we keep saying that i've got it you have to change i've got it you have to change then we never change and that keeps the world in the same place and that's yeah that's again that human behavior that yeah, the brain is always overconfident. I learned this on this show called uh, Brain Games. It's always overconfident in pretty much everything you think. It thinks it's got it because it, you have to be that confident to just not like fall over trying to think and walk and like be on the cell phone and things like that. You have to. Your brain has to give you the confidence to do that. And so, yeah, we always think we got it, but most of the times we don't. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, I can quote this, people are only prepared to see wait i can't quote it but essentially you're only Look you only see what you're prepared to see mm. that's the quote that's it and uh, you mentioned brain games which is like one of our favorite shows we've worn it out yes but Love uh, that show. it's like there's a quote there like when you get to like the quantum physics aspect mm-hmm. of like how many billions of bytes of information are there in in our awareness right now yeah but our brain can only process like what four to 12 bytes or something right, like that at a time and i always ask people like when i mention that it's like so what else what else is like right here in front of us that we're just not processing mm. because as ralph waldo Emerson said we're not prepared to see it yet yeah just out of your vision yeah and uh, the, well i don't want to get it all into a science <laughs> <laughs> science lesson but i was just thinking about eyes and how they're just receptors and they only see a very small amount of the energy that's available in the known universe so like just thinking about how limited that is is like yeah wow. the more you know the more you know you don't know i i think the interesting thing about all this discussion too when it gets into science is that like we're talking about we're talking about conditioning we're also talking about like kind of like uh things you were born with yeah and there's interesting things about the brain that there may be things or we could divide it into like circumstance and like things you have power over too Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. there's like the other end of the coin where it takes like 30 days to create a habit where you can like you can reprogram the neurons in your brain you can take advantage of like that that is the the way that your brain has been has has been from like birth Mm -hmm. you can take advantage of those things that are not serving you as well yeah and kind of reprogram those neurons to not fight or flight in that way too so that change doesn't like it's not hopeless at least i don't believe it's hopeless no it's not and the fact that we are fighting means that it's not hopeless because if there was no hope what would be the point of fighting um i love that you brought that science in because i want to say something to that effect and so uh if you speaking of habits if you've ever read that book seven habits of highly effective people the first habit is to be proactive so we have a brain that takes in all this information and we can either accept it and keep it or accept it and and let it go and so what he's saying is like with media and like your parents and all these other people um there's a lot of people uh competing for the space in your brain but what you have to do is be proactive about what you accept and keep and what you accept and and let go um and then that leads us to the point that you can use 
yeah the other part of the nature of your brain the elasticity of it because you have a hundred billion neurons in your brain and it's so easily conditioned that you can change a habit within 30 days when you think about that that's a very short amount of time uh to change something that significant so yeah you can start to use new neural pathways and then your brain starts getting used to using those neural pathways and eventually it just becomes it kind of gets in a rut but like that also works against us when we have bad habits but you can form a new good habit just yeah based on that brain chemistry that yeah is also part of the the human behavior we could go a whole other hour on neuroplasticity yeah <laughs> but we don't have the time this, this has been amazing uh, Darian yes. you, artist, author uh, record exec you know, label exec <laughs> yeah. how can people get in touch with you Like, what's the social digits uh, Darian Wigfall on Facebook uh, at Darian underscore wig on Twitter I'm not on there as much um really um yeah i'm mostly on facebook you can find me there most of the time i try not to be on social media as much because i understand how that works on our brain too uh but you know it's it's a it's a necessary part of what we do with the music um but if you want to I, i'll even give you my far-fetched email uh <laughs> we are far-fetched at gmail.com um yeah and people can get your book on amazon is yep, it okay on amazon uh just put it in dunaway books on south grand too so they have a few copies uh mocha bees might still have a few copies i'm trying to get it in a few more stores around st louis as well and if if somebody you know is the next the first name that came to that mind was nelly i'm sorry but somebody's the next <laughs> nelly how do they get in touch with uh write to info info at we are farfetched dot awesome. net yeah. awesome well, Darren, it was a pleasure having you. I feel like we could probably talk for another hour. Yeah, I really <laughs> could, especially with you Geminis, man. We talk about anything and it would be interesting. But uh, but there are people that have to go and listen to something else. So, Fair so we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for being here. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And if you're in St. Louis, visit us on a Thursday night. Details at vincafstl.org. And connect with us on social at We Are Slam or at Venture Cafe STL. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins. So think about-